Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. Uh, today we are on our last uh, sermon, our last message concerning uh, the book of Job. Uh, it's sermon number 13 and it's called God Comforts Job. So we've been following the journey of the life of Job and what happens to him and uh, endeavouring to uh, understand and to do so much more than that, but to actually share and teach what the purpose of the book of Job is in the canon of scripture. The book of Job is wisdom literature and it is a whole book and a large book devoted to the notion of why do we suffer? And so this uh, book uh, sets itself apart from all other books in the Bible and it has something that resonates with each and every person. As people of faith, we believe that Jesus came and suffered for our sins. And so we have come to the end of the book of Job. If we take a step back and consider what has happened, we now seek a conclusion to his journey and the circumstances that he found himself in. Job went from being what he thought was in control to suffering and realizing that he was out of control. A humbling situation to say the least. In the first two chapters we learned how Job was put in a trial because Satan asserted God was not just because he only blesses his people. Satan declared the only reason people serve God is for the blessing that God gives them. So Job becomes a test to see if he will serve God for who he is or for the blessings God gives. We have to see the heart behind this because Satan has some truth in what he has to say. Because he's challenging God that people only serve him because of the blessings that, he, that they receive. And so as people today, we have to ask ourselves the same question. Are we only serving God because we expect to receive something back? Or do we just serve God because we serve God without any conditions whatsoever? So after losing his children, his wealth and his health, Job did not curse God. Even though he feels that he has lost his relationship with God, Job continues to maintain his own righteousness and does not turn his back on God as Satan claimed that he would. Job's friends came to comfort him and told him he needs to repent for the blessings of God to return. But Job maintained sin was not the cause of his suffering. Job believed God was not being fair to him because he is righteous. Elihu then speaks up and tells the three friends and Job that they are all wrong in their understandings about how God runs the world. Until finally the Lord appears out of a storm and challenges Job to explain his power and his wisdom, but of course he can't. Job's final words are words of repentance before God. The last scripture we read last week from the book of Job was from Job 42 verse 6 when he said, Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And so that was the last word that we looked at last week. So how does all this end and what can we learn from the book of Job? Today's message is about restoration from suffering and it reveals God's character. So let's begin by opening our Bibles and reading from Job chapter 42 verses 7 to 9 which I have titled The Need to Repent. So again, that's Job chapter 42, verses 7 to 9, which I have titled, The Need to Repent. It reads, After the Lord had said these things, sorry, I'll just put the reference on the screen behind me, Job 42, verses 7 to 9. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the, Tem- the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. 
So now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. So my first question for today is, what is your first reaction to this portion of Scripture? So what do you think is going on here? The Lord tells Eliphaz, I'm angry with you and your friends because they didn't speak the truth about him. He says as well, as my servant Job has. So he's actually separating their behavior. He then tells them to make a sacrifice, a burnt offering. And he says, when they do that, they're there to take them to whom? To Job to make the sacrifice. And then, as he is saying, you have not spoken the truth about me, but my servant Job has. He says then that the Lord will accept whose prayer? Job's prayer. So what do you feel is going on here? What point is the Lord making and why is he lifting Job up whilst he's accusing and asking his friends to repent for what they have said? Any thoughts? Well, because they they were, it was like they were um, speaking for God, but they were speaking falsely for God. Right. Um, whereas, although Job was um, almost accusing God, he didn't speak falsely of God. Um, and then, uh, I, I believe that the, he said that Job's prayer because their prayer, their prayer, if it's false, is not going to resonate to God. Right. So they're using, he's, he's saying to ask Job to pray. Right. Because he will listen to Job. Right. So the thing with Job is that Job accused God of being unjust. But Job never spoke on behalf of God. Mm. Whereas his three friends... They all decided they would speak on behalf of God untruthfully or falsely. And so that's what separates the differences between them. So the next question is, why do you think that Eliphaz, Bildad and Zophar are instructed to go to Job to sacrifice a burnt offering? Why are they to go to Job? Is, does he become the representative? Right. So in this situation, Job is being elected to be their high priest before God. Okay, so God is making this clear and God is giving Job a position that sets him apart from the other three friends. My next question is, why do you think it is Job who will pray for them and not the other way around? So these are all things that have come up in this initial uh, scripture portion that we've read so far. Why do you think Job will pray for them and not the other way around? Because he's the righteous one. Because he's the the righteous one. Mm -hmm. um, probably, or he is. Well, is I he mean, righteous? He's well, he's been like the elect priest, hasn't he? So he's, he's the communication between man and God. Right, so he's the become the intercessor. Yes. Job is righteous. If you actually go back to the beginning of the book of Job, the Lord says that Job is yeah. upright and he is a righteous person and that he has fear for the Lord. So in other words, he has reverence for God. And so we see <coughs> in this that that is the case. But the thing is, is that Job has been made a high priest, and as a high priest, he is an intercessor in prayer as well. So it is up to him to make the sacrifice and him to pray 
for those who mm. have sinned. And, and also, I guess as well, you, if you read back, he actually um, he concedes fault and he he apologizes before God. Right. And so that was the so last. That's like an acceptance that God accepts his apology. Correct. Perfect. Because the last scripture from the previous lesson, Job 42, 6 said that Job said, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So Job has already acknowledged that he is wrong in what he has done. And so, of course, when we repent, the message for us is that the Lord accepts, forgives and restores as a consequence of it. So the Lord first turns his attention to the three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad and Zophar. His anger burns against them because they did not speak what is right about him. So what did Job's friends say about God? What is the key that we've been going over and over throughout this series of teaching? What did they do? What did they say about God that was not correct? Well, basically... If calamity comes upon you, then um, it means that you're that you're a sinner. Right. You've sinned, and that you need to ask for repentance. Right. Perfect. That's awesome. So his friends said he was suffering because God was punishing him for his sins, but the Lord declares that this is not right. He says you are not to draw a conclusion that he is punishing you if you are suffering. God does not use suffering to repay you for your sin. Okay, so they're basically saying that suffering is a price for sin. This is where Elihu, the fourth friend, steps in and makes a difference. He said God uses suffering as a corrective tool to turn our souls away from the pit of hell. So in essence, this is what Elihu has to say. And this is important. Elihu says that suffering causes you to turn your attention beyond yourself and towards God, who rules over all things. It's interesting that when Elihu spoke, one of the things he did was he talked about God the Creator. When the Lord spoke, he also spoke about himself as the Creator. And so in what Elihu is saying, he says... Suffering causes you to turn your attention beyond yourself and towards God who rules over all things. So in other words, get over yourself. Not everything is about you. Pain reminds you this world is not your goal for it will never be perfect nor completely fulfilling. This is why faith and hope must cause you to long to go home to be with the Lord. So in other words, if you put all of your eggs in the basket of life and say at some point in time everything will be absolutely perfect and then you'll be happy then basically the message is that's not going to happen the pain that comes from suffering reminds you that the world is not your goal why the only reason you're suffering is because you are of this world and in this world you are of the flesh and so there is suffering that comes with that So not only does Job's three friends need to repent for what they have said, but the Lord instructs them to go to Job because he will be the one who acts as their intercessor for them. Job will function as a priest because it is he who receives the offering before praying on behalf of all three of them. God turns the whole situation upside down. It was Job's three friends who called him a sinner But when God speaks, he calls Job my servant four times in this scripture and appoints him to intercede for their sin. Interesting, isn't it? How man's perception of somebody else is so different to God's. And therein lies the persecution of man. Man's very willing to judge and condemn. Whereas we see here that even though they've done that, God does not see him in the same light. Job seems to be vindicated, exonerated or justified, depending on your understanding of the word, they all mean the same, by God before his three friends. But God is not calling on the four of them to offer sacrifices for their sin, 
but rather Job acts as priest on behalf of his three friends because they have been wrong about God and wrong about Job. So in other words, what's come out of their mouth has misrepresented God to Job, misrepresented Job to God, and actually misrepresented both of the character of God and of Job. And so they've fallen well short. If you turn your Bibles back to the beginning, to Job chapter 1 verse 5, I will put this up on the screen behind me, you'll read how he would do for his children what God now asked him to do for his three friends. And so we find with the book of Job, it's like it's got bookends. The things that start at the beginning reoccur at the end. And Job 1.5 says that when a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. So he's talking about his sons and daughters here. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and, what's that word? Cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. So what's the whole background behind this? is that Satan believed that Job would curse God if he was beset by suffering. What does Job do for his own kids? Just in case my children have sinned and cursed God, in their hearts he will make a sacrifice. And so here he is now being called by God to make a sacrifice of a burnt offering for each of those who have sinned and cursed God. And that is now who? Eliphaz, Bildad, and so far. And so we see that the opening of this story ends up revealing the same in the closing of the story. What happens here is that the character of God does not change, but the character of man is both revealed and a price has to be paid for it. And this is part of the journey of realisation that Job uh, has and also for each of us who read this scripture. So Job offered sacrifices on behalf of each of his children in case they had sinned, and it says he made arrangements for them to be purified. So my next question is, do you see the connection with Jesus Christ? And if you do, what do you think it is? What is the connection with Jesus Christ. Challenging question. Do we see Christ-like behavior in Job's actions? Yeah. Any thoughts on how to explain? It's okay if you don't. Or... Well, I mean, I just see it as um, the sacrifice of Jesus where um, we're, his, we're his children and we um, we sin and right. he's, he was the sacrifice for us. He gave of himself. Right. So in Job's journey, he was counted as a transgressor, right? a sinner. And he was treated by his friends as if the wrath of God was upon him. And so in this, in Job's actions, we see a Christ-like behavior because Jesus was also counted amongst the transgressors and treated as if the wrath of God was upon him, and yet he remained a servant of God, as we're finding out here with Job, and we must come to him in order that our sins can be forgiven. So in other words, these people, his friends, treated Job as if the wrath of God was upon him. Right? Job was counted amongst those who sinned. Well, the same happened to Jesus, and yet Jesus was the servant of God and we have to come to him in order that our sins are forgiven and so what does God do? He tells Job's friends to go to Job in order to have their sins forgiven. So in other words those who are paying the price are the ones that we have to come to in order to have our 
sins forgiven. So in other words, humbling stuff. We're not in control. In our case, and for many other people, Jesus is our high priest who offered himself as the perfect sacrifice on our behalf so that he could intercede for us. And so it is important for us to understand, just like Jesus, it is the rejected who become exalted by God. So God uses those who are rejected by man to be his servants. Now we talk about Jesus being pure, without sin and holy, but he was completely rejected. Caiaphas, the high priest, called him a blasphemer, meaning he was a sinner and that he had to pay the price as a consequence and be put to death. So in other words, he was counted amongst the transgressors and he was to receive the wrath of God. Caiaphas saw the wrath of God as coming through his command, but the net effect was exactly the same. And so it is the rejected who become exalted by God. And so if you're listening to this message, when you're going through life and things are difficult and perhaps you're feeling rejected, just remember it is you who God exalts. And it's something which will help you to lift yourself back up. So it is for each of us to consider the beauty, and this is the word, the beauty of forgiveness. When Job repents for what he said about God, God restores him back into relationship and calls Job his servant. In the same way as Jesus intercedes for us, when Job's three friends repent and offer their sacrifices, God accepts Job's prayer as it says in verse 9. And so when we repent to the Lord, what do we do? We ask for forgiveness in the name of Jesus, because he is our high priest. As he said, he is the son of man. He came here to represent us to the father. So I hope you're all receiving this message loud and clear this morning. What a blessing and a joy it is to know that when you repent, God restores you and you are able to enjoy a relationship with him again. So we're going to now read from the rest of the uh, book of Job, chapter 42, verses 10 to 17, the last of the scripture for the book of Job. So again, Job 42, beg your pardon, I've got a typo on here. Job 42, verses 10 to 17. And I've called this the same as the title of today's message, God comforts Job. So reading from verse 10. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. How fickle people are. eh? They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yak of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapuch. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. This is very unusual, by the way, because inheritance is normally only passed through the male members of families. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And so Job died an old man and full of years. So after a lengthy period of putting himself first, It is not until after Job prays for his friends that we see the Lord bringing comfort to him. Interesting, isn't it? 
It is not until after Job prays for his friends that we see the Lord bringing comfort to him. So in other words, part of Job's journey is that he has to forgive others in order for the Lord to bless him. And so again, there's a very strong message in there. Think about your own life and your own journey. And you might think, well, things aren't fair, etc. You may think that there's others that are coming against you and you haven't forgiven them. And then you're saying, well, why am I being blessed? I'm a good person. But the fact is, is that if you haven't forgiven those who come against you, then the Lord's blessing is possibly being withheld from you. So the Lord not only restored the fortunes Job had lost, but by the numbers we can see that he gave him twice as much as he had before, but only in the livestock. In terms of his family, Job had lost ten children, seven sons and three daughters, and now he is given ten children, seven sons and three daughters. The difference, however, that we see in the writing, if you go back to the beginning of Job, it doesn't say that his daughters were the most beautiful in the land and he gave them an inheritance of their own. It just says he had seven sons and three daughters. And so we do see an escalation come through this because the, the, the scriptures tell us three new daughters whose beauty had no compare in the land, it says. Of course, he's living in the land of Uz, which we look at as around um, Damascus, around uh, Syria, uh, above Israel today. After all that had transpired, Job was then given another 140 years. So he wasn't given 140 years in total. He was given another 140 years to live a life in which he got to see his children and their children being born and growing up until the fourth generation. So his other children were already adults. And so in this, we see someone who's probably likened to Abraham, where he has one family and he's already elderly. And then what happened with Abraham? He remarried a lady by the name of Keturah and he had six children after that. And so Abraham lived to a old age. So we find here that the same happens. And it gives us the description to understand that because it says, They were being born and growing until the fourth generation. So it's a considerable time. So it's important to note that although Job is fully restored after his trial, God does not give everything back that he lost during the trial. Job still lost 10 children, and having 10 more doesn't mean the pain from losing losing his other children was erased. So my question to you is, how does this make you feel? Why doesn't God give back what was taken? Put aside your understanding that that means that they would have to be resurrected. Because the Bible tells us that the Lord can resurrect people. And it wasn't just Jesus who was resurrected. But you have to place yourself in the same shoes. If you had 10 children and lost them, Everything was restored to you and then you had another 10 children. Does that mean that you would forget your first 10 children or not care or not suffer or not feel any pain because of what happened? So we would, wouldn't we? We would still feel the pain, but why doesn't God give back what was taken? What would God's purpose be in that? Remember, he permitted Satan to take everything from him apart from his life. And as it turned out, his wife, because he obviously needed her to have another 10 children. That's if, he, if she was the same wife. <laughs> right. The story doesn't tell us, but we'll assume that, that's the case. Yeah, the way that she was talking to him wasn't very nice. <laughs> um, I don't know. Is it, would it be because through his new knowledge and understanding of God, that the seed that comes from from then on would be different to the seed? I'm sure they would. I'm sure they would. Because, I mean, I believe that whatever you believe in can be passed on to new children, you know, because there's there's like a a God-given... Well, the wisdom of his experience, he would certainly be sharing with his children as they grew up. I'm sure he would tell them what happened to him and why and 
the consequence of it and how blessed he is now to have them as his new children and so on. Any, any other thoughts? I mean, I, I, I look at, I mean, it's probably not answering your question, but I look at the way that he blessed his daughters as well, was he had a almost like a refreshing new, um, you know, like his, his, probably his love for them is even stronger than before. Right. Because how, you know, how we can just be lost just like that. You know, I guess it's like when you have an illness and you come out of it, you feel yep. a different person. Right. You you That's sort of it. embrace life differently to what you would, would have yep. been previous. Yep. I, I think that's all. It's all very good. The thing is, the theme of this book is what tool does God use to correct and change people? Anyone? <laughs> it's suffering. Yeah. We've been talking about suffering for 13 <laughs> weeks. It's suffering. So in other words, suffering and its purpose, so this is the point, and its purpose cannot be undone. You can't undo suffering. It's part of your life's journey. It's part of your experience. Mm. For if it was undone, then it would serve no purpose at all. So in other words, if everything that was taken away from you was given back to you when you change yourself or your heart as a person, would you then have experienced, sorry, have learned anything? Something to think about, isn't it? You, when things happen and we correct behavior, often the reward is to give them back what's causing the issue in the first place. We find here that Lord, the Lord doesn't give back because it would serve no purpose. In other words, the suffering would not count because people get it back again. And what do they do? Notoriously, human nature says, they just go and do it again. And so the Lord takes away and he doesn't give back so that the purpose of him taking away has an outcome. And so sometimes for us, Things are taken away from us or we take things away from our children because we want to correct them and change them. Giving it back to them isn't the answer. So the message cannot be, if you remain faithful, God will bless you in this life because God does not have to restore Job after his trial. He doesn't have to do it. God is under no obligation to give anything to Job once his trial has concluded. So my next question is, what are we learning about God here? Think about it. This is what God has allowed to happen to Job. He has a purpose in his suffering. So what do we learn about God here? Because this is what we need to understand. We always look at the lessons and how they apply to us. But aren't we meant to be finding out on our journey who God is and what his purpose is for our lives? And so when we read this, we have to ask ourselves, what are we learning about God from this experience? Well, he loves us. Right. He loves us. So in other words, he wouldn't correct us or allow suffering to happen if he didn't want us to change and if he wants us to change he wants us to change because he loves us if we don't care we don't we wouldn't do anything would we so agree any any other thoughts what's the word in the title of today's message god comforts job when jesus was going to the cross the cross god sent an angel to comfort him. When we speak about Jesus, we speak about him as our comforter. And so somebody who loves us wants to comfort us. In other words, he's not going to take away the journey or the experience, but he's going to comfort us as we go through that journey. When Jesus went to the cross, what happened? He went to the Garden of Gethsemane 
and he lay prostrate on the ground and he prayed to the Father and he said, Is there any other way? And so the Lord sent a comforter to him, but he didn't change the path. And so the story of Job is that his path was never changed, but when he repented, God came in and comforted him. He didn't change what had happened before. And so God will be here for you to comfort you when you need it, but he's not going to change his purpose for you or what he teaches you or corrects you through suffering. So what God does for Job flows from his infinite love and grace, not because he's obliged by Job's righteousness. And so one of the things we have here is we feel that if we correct ourselves and we're a good person before God, then God is obliged to take care of us. The message that we're getting through the book of Job is that that's not the case at all. God is who? God is. It's us who needs him, it's not he who needs us. And so in this, we have to change our perspective of whom God is. In the modern era we live in, we are almost creating whom our God is, and we are worshipping him the way that we want to worship him, and we give messages about what we want to give about him, instead of the word that he gives to us. And so in the book of Job, we see Job going on his merry way. And when we read from Job chapter 1 verse 5, what did he say? He said, early in the morning he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of his children, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. So in other words, he's trying to control the outcome, whether it happened or not. He basically thinks, if I do this, then I cover my kids. They're free. They're okay. But God's not saying that, is he? He's saying you're still accountable and you're still responsible and you'll still be punished. However, I will comfort you when you repent. And so when we make the sacrifices to God or when Jesus sacrificed him to God, it was the enactment of that process that facilitates the outcome. And so God calls Job to do the same for his three friends as he was doing for his children earlier before. None of this changes who God is. So this is what you need to hear in the midst of suffering and trial. God can bring you good after your trouble and God can console you after your trial and after your disaster. But the point you may not want to hear is that God will not necessarily fix your life. This is the problem that we have, isn't it? And this is a subject of many conversations, many messages, and in fact, much prayer. That there's an expectation, an entitlement mentality that God will fix our lives. But when we understand how everything works, and we've made this clear through this teaching, is that God gives you a free will. And it is by the choices that you make that your lives become messed up. It is not God, (coughs) excuse me, it is not God's position to then eradicate all of that for you because they're the choices that you make. What he's going to do if you repent for what you've done wrong in so doing, is he's going to comfort you as a result of that. God is not defined as either good or bad according to what he does for you. And you have to realise that the suffering you have endured or may be enduring is not the end of your life. In other words, we will carry on, we will suffer, but it doesn't mean our life has come to an end. When Jesus went to the cross and he suffered on our behalf, his earthly life came to an end. So good can still come in the future. And so I have another message for you. This is the message of the book of Job. 
It is not that God will make everything better after you have suffered a trial, but rather that God really does care about his people and is able to bless you both in your pain and after your loss. If you take note of the language, it says to bless you both in your pain and after your loss, meaning it's not God's pain or God's loss, but he's going to love you and comfort you. So as people, as Christian folk, we're told to go out and to help people, to comfort them in their hour of need. Does that mean that we're actually suffering the same trial? Of course it doesn't. Does it mean we shouldn't help them? Of course we should. And so this is the same character that we see with God. God will not make everything better. Okay? People's prayers is that after everything happens that something will become better. But this is not the purpose of God. God's purpose is to comfort us when our choices lead us to outcomes that we don't want. Right now we have this issue where apparently the count's up to something like 2,300 rockets were fired from Gaza into Israel. People have died. Property has been destroyed. Many are injured. The Israelites, of course, retaliated and they then bombed the sites from where these missiles were fired from. The media get on this, man gets on there with his opinion, they take their sides. But is God making any of these people do this? Are people claiming that they're doing it in God's name? Absolutely. But God is not making them do it. Who do they turn to when they mourn their loss? God. Why? Because they see God as their comforter. Does it change what's happened? No. Will it necessarily change the future? Well, history shows that it doesn't. So what's left? People make choices. God comforts. And we see this playing out throughout life, day in, day out. It doesn't really ever change. Okay. So... I'm just going to put up a title behind me for the last portion to come. The title is A Message About Suffering and How God Runs the World. This is, again, all about wrapping up the Book of Job, looking at the outcomes and understanding about suffering and understanding how God runs the world. So God can bless you and be generous to you. But it's because of his own character and his own choice, not yours. So to be clear, when we do things, even righteously, to, to expect to be blessed by God because we're doing those things is not necessarily the case. You do not and never will control God. Your faith can't be based on outcomes, it can't dictate that you should suffer or be prosperous one way or the other. There are poor people who suffer who have great faith in God. There are prosperous people who have great faith in God. Our financial or material circumstances don't dictate our faith in God, and nor should they. Satan said that God couldn't bless people because he causes them to serve for their own selfish purposes. This is the story of the book of Job. He said that if he took away all the blessings that God gave to Job, because he understands that everything that we have is a blessing from God. Right? But what happened? It was taken away and Job didn't curse him. And so Satan failed at this point in time. God's response is that he can bless people because he only does so from his own character and his will. Satan says to you, 
if you do this and God doesn't give you something, then your God is? Perhaps he's not your God. Perhaps he's not real. Right? You don't need him. You're in control. Do for yourself. But God says, I'm going to bless you because it's my choice, not because of what you have done. God does bless the righteous because that is his desire. We're not saying here that God doesn't bless righteous people. But it is his desire, not that of the recipient. And so our walk with the Lord is not to do it because we expect to get something back from God. So let me give you an example. I don't have to bless my kids for doing good. But I should want to bless them when they do well. They cannot look at me and say I owe them something for getting good grades at school. For this is a selfish entitlement mentality. What my kids should receive is my love and generosity given by my discretion because I want to do good for them, not something that is measured by other people. You must serve God for nothing and understand God is free to bless as he chooses. Your suffering or my suffering shows that we do not serve God for nothing when we remain faithful to him. And so what we do for one another, for our kids, for our partners, for other people, is not something that can be measured by another. When we do something, it is our blessing to another. It shouldn't be something that's an outcome of a measure of somebody else, and certainly not of Satan himself, as we see here in the story of Job. We read in verse 11 today, it says, They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him. This point was made repeatedly at the beginning of this sermon series, and the book of Job emphasizes this point again at the end. Who is ultimately responsible for suffering and trials? Who's responsible? Have you got this? Who is ultimately responsible for suffering and trials? Is it? Is it? What would you say if I said that God is? Who created everything? Who created man with a free will? Who created the angels? Who cast Satan and his demons out of heaven and onto this earth to roam? How can suffering be defined if there's nothing there? of its own substance. Did you create yourselves? No. no. Did you create and define what suffering is? No. You can make choices that would lead you to suffer, but what we're talking about here is who is responsible. And so God is. Yes, Satan does evil, but it is God who allows Satan to do it. What happened in the story of Job? Satan came to God and said, I want to do this to Job to prove to you that he only loves you for what you give him. And God said, That's not what God said. And neither is that. God said, Go ahead. And so we take notice of what's actually happening and what's being said. We realize that at the end of the day, that God is responsible. Even Satan asked for permission for what we read about in the book of Job. Satan is not operating outside of God's knowledge, God's power, or God's control. 
It is God who cast him here to roam on the earth. As difficult as it may seem, you must accept this. Otherwise, the encouragement of Scripture could be meaningless to you. So I'm going to take you to an example. There is others. This one is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And it says, No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. So what does that tell us? It tells us that God tests everyone. God is faithful and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. So when you are suffering from trials, then the Lord is saying you can cope with it. He only gives what you can manage within your own strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. So in other words, would you endure a trial or suffering or a test if you didn't think there was going to be any way out or it ever come to a close? You wouldn't, would you? You'd probably say, oh, well, I give up. I've had enough. What did Job do in the story that we've just read? How many times did he say he wanted to crawl into the grave and give up? He repeated this several times. Why did he say that? Because he was looking for a way out. But God's saying, Job, I'm going to give you a way out. You simply have to change. And so this is the lesson that he did learn, isn't it? He finally repented and he was blessed once again. And so this message here is part of the human condition and the human journey is that God will test you and he will test you in such a way that it is common to everyone. So if you think that you're going through something that no one else has been through before, think again. Often people start a communication with, you you probably won't understand, but you may not have heard of this before, but you know, I'm going through something which no one else has had to go through before. It's awful, but the fact is, the Lord tells us that testing is common to everyone. It also makes a very clear statement. This says that God is faithful. So in other words, no matter what you're going through, he will always be there for you. He will not let you be tested beyond what you're able to manage with. And the testing will provide a way out so that you may be able to endure. What do you think the way out is? We're talking about God testing. What is the way out? The way out of what? What ultimately are we trying to get out of? So fine. Is it? What did you say? So fine. Uh, sin. Sin. That's right. We're looking for a way out of sin. So in other words, we have to endure suffering in life in order to find a way out of sin. We have to endure tests and trials in life in order to find a way out of sin. If those things weren't brought against us, we would just keep sinning. There would be no reason not to. And so there's a purpose in all that God does. The only way this can be true is if God rules over evil rules over suffering, rules over Satan, and decrees the extent and the limits of temptations and trials. Therefore, you are called to trust in the wisdom, power, and knowledge of God. This is true faith. This is God's answer to the book of Job. God is in control, and you are to trust him with your life. And we're going to go to the book of James, which we did in the previous series, and you're going to find something which you will probably have more of an impact on you now after studying the book of Job than it did when we were reading the book of James. So we're going to go to James chapter 5, verses 7 to 11. So James 5, verses 7 to 11. It reads, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. 
Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Another reason why I say you better know what they have to say. And in verse 11, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. And then it reads, You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And so there's a specific reference of all the people. James mentions Job. He says, You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. So in other words, when he's talking at that point in time after Christ has been uh, resurrected, he's basically saying to all of those who are around him, because he's, of course, walking with the Jewish population, you have heard of the steadfastness of Job. In other words, you know the story of Job. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord. How the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So in conclusion today, and to conclude our series on Job, we are called to be patient until the Lord returns. That's number one. Look at the examples of suffering and patience from the prophets. And even James, the half-brother of Jesus, says to consider the endurance and steadfastness of Job. In Job you see the purpose and outcome of the Lord. And that is, the Lord is compassionate and merciful. God blesses and God allows suffering. This is what the writers of Hebrews is getting at when he speaks of the discipline of the Lord and compares it how, with how parents deal with their children. Parents bless and parents discipline, but both display the compassion and mercy of God. Parents do this for their children and God does this for his children. It may be difficult to comprehend, but God does have a greater purpose for allowing evil and suffering in this world. We are to trust in his wisdom, to trust in his compassion, and trust in his mercy. And so that brings us to the end of our message today and brings us to the end of our sermon series on the book of Job. So we're just going to close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the teaching that comes from the book of Job. Not only does it delve into the character of humanity, but it also reveals to us more about who you are in our lives, Lord. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness if we ever think that by something that we do, that we will somehow be blessed by you in expectation. Lord, we understand that you bless us because you want to bless us, not because of what we do. Lord, it is hard to comprehend suffering in our lives, and we all have sufferance in some way, shape or form, and at some point in time, and none of us like it. We see that suffering changes us as we don't want to continue in pain. And as a consequence of that, we will do something differently. We will change how we walk. We will change how we take care of ourselves. We will remove risks that are not necessary in our lives and so on. So Lord, we thank you today for the suffering that we endure. We thank you for the trials and the tests that you send our way. And we also thank you for the free will that you gave us in order that through all of this we can learn and we can change and we can be forgiven. Lord, it is by your grace that you sent Jesus to ultimately suffer on that cross on our behalf. It is by your compassion and mercy for each and every one of us that your son suffered so much. And yet through that suffering, nothing 
was changed, it was something that had to be done because we are unable to do it for ourselves. So Lord, we thank you today in Jesus' mighty name that you teach us that suffering is something that is both good for us and something that will change us in order to receive eternal life. Lord, we give thanks for your message in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So as we close today, um, if you'd like to watch this message back, you can watch it on Facebook where we're broadcasting from. Uh, it will be uploaded and available in high definition on YouTube tomorrow. If you type in Paul Brunson, the Jesus Movement, you can subscribe there. And it's also available on our website, thejesusmovement.com.au. So thank you so much for joining us. God bless you. And we look forward to your company next time.